And uh, we practice a lot of uh, matrimonial law. We do employment, labor disputes. We also handle some personal injury matters. Um, but I think our biggest and best um, practice group is our trust and estates group. Um, I'm one of the partners who leads the elder law department within the trust and estates group. And the focus of my practice is to essentially assist clients with asset protection. Um, preparing for getting um, possible government benefits like Medicaid and assisting people with protecting what they've worked so very hard to collect through the years. So I am um, pleased to be here. Thank you to Parker Jewish for having us and for conducting this series with us. And I look forward to presenting. Um, so I just want to start off with very basic uh, 101 kind of information, and then we can go into a little bit deeper and, uh, and more specific um, matters pertaining to Medicaid planning. Uh, I'd like to keep all the questions to the end just so that we can you know, continue the flow and, and it can go smoothly because some things do mesh into others. So I want to make sure that we don't miss anything. Um, so I'd appreciate holding off on all questions. Estate planning is such a very important topic and I feel like a lot of people think that you should only get involved in estate planning when you're at a certain age or when your health is failing or you know, if you have a lot of money. And that's not the case at all. I recommend estate planning to anybody really over the age of 18. If your college go away, uh, your kids go away to college, they should have an estate plan. They should have a power of attorney. They should have a healthcare proxy. Um, estate planning is for everybody. And it's just so very important that everyone has an estate plan because things can happen to anybody. It doesn't matter whether you're healthy, whether you're ill, or whether you, you know, have assets or not. Someone needs to be able to assist you in an event that you were ever to become sick, ill, incapacitated, have an accident. You know, um, unfortunately, we hear all these stories of, of everybody of all ages getting sick or being unable to take care of themselves. So putting together an estate plan is really just so important for everybody. And what does an estate plan mean? Um, one of the common misconceptions that I hear constantly from clients is they walk in and the first thing they say is, I need a will. It's like, yes, you do need a will. However, you need a whole bunch of other documents that are even more useful than a will. Um, a will is only one part of an estate plan where there's, a, you know, an assortment of other documents and other things that can assist your family take care, to take care of you. So it's important that an estate plan is composed of at least four items. The first three are going to be used while you are alive. So the first document, we'll start with that one, to me is the most important document. As an elder law attorney, as someone who helps people when they're not capable of helping themselves or helps families help my clients when they're not able to take care of themselves, that power of attorney is key. Power of attorney allows someone to jump in and assist you in the event that you couldn't take care of your finances, you couldn't speak to your insurance company. You couldn't deal with your day-to-day -day banking, paying bills, uh, making phone calls, or anything else that may be needed. Obtaining records, financial records, medical records, all of that is so very important. And if your name is not the person on that account, or it's not your um, insurance, or it's not your bank account, you're not able to assist your family member, even your spouse, legally, Spouses are not able to, to handle finances for one another. If you have a joint account, you can both access that joint account, but that's the only thing you can do. My husband may be the beneficiary on my 401k, maybe the beneficiary on my life insurance, but he does not have any access to those assets while I'm alive because those assets are mine. They're in my name. So if he needed to pull money out of my 401k because I got sick and we needed to withdraw some money from there to take care of me, or he needed to withdraw cash value from my life insurance, technically he is not allowed to do that because his name is not Constantina Papa Giorgio. Even though he's the beneficiary, he has no access to that account while I'm alive. Beneficiary means he can get it after I'm deceased. But while I'm alive, he has zero access. He can't even call the company to ask for a statement. So 
that power of attorney is so important and is, is always the first question that I ask clients when they come in. If children come in to tell me my dad had a stroke or my mom developed dementia and it's gotten really bad in the last few months, what can I do? I need them to have that power of attorney in place so that I could be able to facilitate any kind of planning or to be able to tell them what they can do for their parents. Even something so simple as taking them to the doctor or taking them to the hospital or the nursing or you know, the rehab after the hospital. You don't want to be the one signing legal documents for your parents if you don't have a power of attorney. So that power of attorney is going to be your key. And it's going to be the document that would allow your loved ones, your trusted loved ones to step in your shoes to make your financial decisions for you. So the, the importance of it, I think I've, I've you know, gone through, but the other part is that this document has to be given to an individual that you trust, right? Because with the importance of it comes the fact that it is a very powerful document. It's a document where you know, you're giving someone unfettered access to your finances. So whoever it is that you would like to be your agent under your power of attorney has to be somebody that you absolutely trust with your life. So don't underestimate that power as well. You can have multiple agents acting under your power of attorney. You can have one person, you can have two, you can have three, um, but just think the more the merrier doesn't work here. <laughs> more opinions can create more drama, right? Especially if you have people with differing uh, ideas or thoughts. So it's important that you put people, if you're going to put multiple agents, you include people that you know can get along or can make decisions together. And you could put successor agents. So let's say you wanted to put one child or one, your spouse as your primary agent under your healthcare proxy, you can put successors after them, which basically says that once all my agents, my initial agent is not capable of helping, I'd like my successors to jump in. So you can put them in order, you can put them together, it's totally up to you. This is a, a document that allows for more than one agent to act at once. And so again, the importance of the power of attorney and what would happen if you didn't have a power of attorney but became incapacitated is that your loved one, whoever it is that's gonna be caring for you, if there was no power of attorney, would need to go to the court to get a legal guardianship of you, basically, so that they can now be able to step in your shoes to make those decisions. I can complain about guardianships all day. I um, am eyeball deep in guardianships. I'm a guardian for 17 different people. The court calls me every time they have a difficult case and they ask me to take some of the cases. Um, guardianships are very difficult. They are very time consuming. They're also very expensive. And so the goal is always to stay out of court, right? If you can prepare this document, this power of attorney and not have court intervention, that would be optimal. So you have your power of attorney done, it's in place. If you're ever in a scenario where you're sick or you're not able to care for yourself, your loved one will use the power of attorney and not have to turn to the court for intervention. So. Again, last synopsis, if, if you haven't heard it the first 10 times already, the power of attorney is very important for you to have. It's the number one document. The second document that I recommend that my clients have is a healthcare proxy. You've probably all signed a healthcare proxy if you've ever gone into a hospital. Uh, if you've gone to the doctor, sometimes they have, you have, they have you sign healthcare proxies there also. A healthcare proxy states who would make your medical decisions only in the event that you could not make them yourself. And so with the healthcare proxy, if you're not able to communicate or you're not able to speak what, and express yourself and say what type of treatment you would like or refuse, your agent under your healthcare proxy is the person who steps in to make that decision for you. So it's very important that you put a like-minded person, somebody who you know who's going to be making the type of decision that you would make, right? I always joke, my mom and dad do everything for me. They take care of my kids 14 hours a day so I could be at the office. They pick up my dry cleaning when I get home too late. They do literally everything to help me. I would never, ever, ever put my mom on a healthcare proxy. She cannot be my agent at all because she does not ever 
she, she wouldn't be able to follow my wishes, right? So while I trust her with my life and I trust her with my children and I trust her with everything, when it comes to a healthcare proxy, one, I wouldn't want to put her in that position. And two, she would never follow my wishes. So she cannot be my healthcare proxy. So although you may trust somebody and you may love someone, right? And you know that they'll, they'll do right by you. You have to pick someone who's like-minded and who thinks the way that you think, especially with regard to your end of life decisions. She's my power of attorney, but she's not my healthcare proxy because what I would want is not what she would be able to do. I don't think she'd be able to carry out my wishes. So the healthcare proxy can only be one agent at a time. So you put your first agent, then you put your second agent, your third, and you can go down as many ages as you want. Um, <clears throat> a lot of times, a lot of my clients can't pick between their children, right? Or um, they prefer their spouse and a child to make the decision together. Unfortunately, the statute doesn't allow for that. It's one person than the second, because you can just imagine what would happen at the hospital if there are two kids or three kids or four kids who can't make a decision. One says left, the other one says right, the other one says up, the other one says down, right? Uh, everyone's got a different opinion. So it could be a huge mess. And so the statute allows for one person at a time. And that's what you should do. Uh, we make it very clear to a lot of the clients who, who can't pick between their kids. We, we tell their children, look, we're choosing in order, but we want you all to, to speak together. Now, hopefully they follow those wishes, but there is no directive. We can put it in the document and say, you know, we want our kids to correspond together. However, there's one individual making that final decision. So make sure you have your healthcare proxies, make sure they're up to date. Um, and again, that will be the person who steps in to help you make your medical decisions only in the event that you could not make them yourself. The third document is called a living will. Living will is the document that states what your end of life decisions are. So specifically, it would say whether or not you would uh, accept or refuse end of life treatment. And really the, the living will only comes into play when you're in your final days, weeks, months. Um, the living will is not a document that I would ever show anybody right now. I have a living will. It states that um, if I was ever in a terminal condition with no reasonable expectation of recovery, and let's say, you know, a couple of doctors said, there's nothing we can do for her to bring her back to her baseline, you know, to ensure that she's going to live the life that she lived before, whether it be a traumatic brain injury, whether it be an aneurysm, um, any other stroke or something like that, that has deemed me to be incapable of making decisions or taking care of myself or communicating or anything. Um, if a doctor, if multiple doctors deem that I'm not able to you know, live essentially, I have um, explained in my document that I don't want to be subject to artificial means of hydration and nutrition. I don't want there to be a situation where I'm, I'm on life support for, you know, months and years. So that's what I've expressed in my living will. And that's what a lot of people tend to express and, and how they feel, but they don't want to be kept alive for artificial means. They also don't want to be given treatment that just prolongs the dying process, right? So that could involve and include given uh, artificial, um, you know, like trach uh, tracheostomies or be given uh, pegs for feeding or even giving people water and food if they're on their final days. So a lot of times when people are in hospice, they may, you know, stop providing nutrients to the, to the body so that it could slowly pass away, but it passes faster than if you were giving food and, and water. So a lot of people feel like they would want to be left to die, you know, at their normal pace, essentially. So the living will is important for that because you don't want there to be misunderstandings, right? You don't want someone to think, oh, well, I, you know, when I spoke to, to mom, mom said that she wanted to be kept alive on a trach, on a ventilator or whatever else. Um, <clears throat> so eliminating, you know, misunderstandings is very important, especially for such a sensitive and tough topic. This is a very hard decision for people to make. And I'm sure many of you have been in this position where you've had to make a decision like this for a loved one. It, you know, eliminating the question of what they would have wanted really makes the decision not easier, but maybe easier to swallow, 
right? Um, because you know that you're doing something that they would have wanted. So the living will states what they would have wanted. And those three documents as a synopsis is, are the healthcare proxy, the power of attorney, and the living will. Those three documents, as I stated, are alive while you're alive. They help your family, your friends, your loved ones take care of you, make your financial decisions for the power of attorney and your medical decisions for the healthcare proxy and the living will. The only document that comes into play at your death, and that's the fourth document, is the last will and testament. The last will and testament directs who's going to inherit your assets after you pass away. That's why to me as the elder law attorney, that one's not as important as everything else, because for me, it's more important to take care of you while you're alive, right? To make sure your family have all the documents that they need to ensure that your wishes are carried out while you're still here. Yes, it's important to state who's going to receive it afterwards, but taking care of you is, is even more important. Um, so the will essentially states who's going to inherit your assets. It directs who's going to be the person distributing your assets. That person is called the executor. It makes arrangements for any type of special planning, whether it be a disabled family member or a loved one or friend that you want to leave an inheritance to. You would want to do special types of planning, include special uh, supplemental needs trusts within your will to ensure that that disabled individual doesn't lose their government benefits if they were to receive an inheritance from you. You can create a trust within your will for your children. It says, as I've done, uh, my children are minors, right? I don't want them to get their hands on any money, even when they turn 18. Um, and everyone has different wishes regarding that. So as a parent, I've decided that within my will, my children will inherit at a certain age. Um, and so the will states that. It states that when my children inherit, it's at the age that is appropriate, from my perspective at least. And we also include estate tax planning provisions within wills. And essentially estate tax planning provisions would be included when assets are nearing the $5.85 million. And so if a family has around that amount of, um, of assets, whether it be real estate, whether it be personal property, cash, bank accounts, or anything else, IRAs, life insurances, all of that is included for estate tax purposes. So it's important, and I always, always uh, urge this, that you're very truthful with your attorney. Um, I always, with my clients, I have them complete a questionnaire before they come to meet me uh, because I've had some, some funny situations in the past. I've had a scenario where a client came in and he said, we don't have that much money. We have about you know, $70,000 in cash and a house. That, that's about it. And so I started giving him my spiel, right? Telling him about estate planning and how important it is and how you know, taxes can be an issue for people who have more assets and how much it would cost for people who had more assets if they didn't plan properly and how much the state would take in estate taxes. By the end of the discussion, it came out that he had six houses, $750,000 in cash. So, you know, <laughs> I can't plan appropriately for you, um, or your attorney or your counselor cannot a plan, appro uh, plan appropriately for you. Just like a doctor can't give you the right prescription if you don't give them the right symptoms or what hurts, right? So it's very important that you, know, you, you provide all of the details to your attorney because they need to be able to put the right plan together for you. So whether it be the state taxes, whether it be a disabled family member you wish to leave it to, whether you think someone is really not capable of managing their own money, right? It could be an adult who has never been financially independent or spends a lot of money and is not able to care for their assets the way that they should. You know, those types of details are important because as attorneys, we can put special provisions within your will to ensure that that individual doesn't just spend through it the first day that they get it. So all of those things get included into wills. And when I do estate planning, even for younger families where we don't have grandchildren or, or you know, more distant relatives, I also tend to put what's called a disaster provision, right? So like for me, I have a small family. It's me, my husband, and my two children. Typically when we travel or when we get into a car, we're all together, right? 
So our wills have something called the disaster provision where something happens to the four of us in a common disaster, who would inherit after that? So you can make several provisions in your will. Um, they will only come into play after you've passed away. So that's the very important thing to remember that the will while you're alive does nothing for you. It doesn't help anybody take care of you, make any medical decisions, financial decisions. You can't put a power of attorney in a will and you can't you know, put anything else into the will that you would want to be in place right now because the will will only come alive after you've passed. So as a synopsis, those are the four documents at a basic estate plan, power of attorney, healthcare proxy, living will, and a last will and testament. A lot of times people want to build on that. And I know that this seminar is more geared toward um, Medicaid planning and elder law planning. So we'll jump into that. When individuals come to me and they say, Constantina, we want to protect our assets because one, we're getting older. We want to make sure that if we ever got sick or had to go into a nursing home or needed care at home, we want to make sure that we can protect our home, let's say, or our cash. It could be anything. The reason why people ask that is because long-term care is expensive, as everybody knows. And long-term care means having care, whether it be in a facility, a nursing home, or it be at home with a home care attendant. Long-term care would be for a permanent basis or a more permanent basis than short-term care. Right? So whether you need someone for six months or 10 months, that would be long-term care. Whether you need someone till the end of your life, that's long-term care. Medicare provides short-term care. Medicare provides assistance to individuals if they're rehabbing or need certain types of assistance. So I'll give you an example. For those who are over 65 and who have Medicare, if let's say I was 66, and I fell down and I hurt my hip. And when I got to the hospital, my Medicare would pay for the hospital, but it only pays for 80%. There is a 20% copay. If I had a supplemental insurance, the supplemental insurance would cover that other 20%. Now, if I had a hip replacement, again, covered by the hospital, 80%, um, covered by Medicare, 80% and the 20% copay would be picked up by my supplement or I would pay it out of pocket. When I left the hospital, I'd then go into a rehab if I wanted to. I could do rehab at home or I could do rehab in the facility. If I chose to do rehab in the facility, Medicare would provide me with 100 total days of rehab. The first 20 are paid in full by Medicare. And then day 21 to 100, there is a copay. They pay about 100, I'm not sure if the numbers just changed this week, but they used to pay about $175 a day. Uh, I'm sorry, they used to pay and leave a copay of $175 per day. So you would have to pay the 175 out of pocket unless you had that supplemental insurance that I mentioned. And it was an insurance that actually picked up this copay for rehab services. So this full 100 days is not paid for fully by Medicare. Now, the important thing to know about Medicare is that it's medical insurance. It is not long-term care. It is short-term health insurance for rehab services. So if I went into the rehab center and I refused to do rehab, I refused to get out of bed, I didn't want to do my PT every day, Medicare is going to cut me off of those 100 days, despite the fact that I didn't use them. So even if I'm on day seven, if I've refused it for all those days, Medicare will say, okay, fine, we're done. We're no longer providing you with the services. So it's important to know that while you have those potential 100 days, you may not get all of them. In another scenario, if I did my rehab and I was getting better and every day I was showing signs of you know, improvement, and then at some point I got to my baseline and there was no further improvement to go up, right? And I just stayed consistent for a week, a few days and I'm doing well and I'm doing my steps and they count how many steps you take and they look at how you're rehabbing. If let's say that's at day 45 
At day 45, they may tell me, Constantina, in 48 hours, we're terminating your Medicare services. It's the same thing. So they don't guarantee you 100 days. So you may, at day 47, then at 45, I get the notice for 48 hours later. At day 47, I now have to choose what I'm doing. Am I going back home? Can I go back home? Or am I staying in the rehab center to turn into nursing home for long-term care? So again, while we have those 100 days, there's no guarantee we're going to get the full 100. So it's very important to keep in mind. And, and if your loved one is in a rehab center, to keep on top of them to make sure that they're not going to get some random you know, termination to say, hey, in 48 hours, you're out of here because then you may be stuck in a situation where you don't know where this loved one is going to end up, especially if they can't go home. So it's important to have those family meetings to make sure you're keeping up with the progress and to just keep in mind that those 100 days are not guaranteed. So you may need to intervene at some point or stay on top of it to make sure that they are doing well. You may need to push that loved one and say, look, I need you to do more rehab. Don't refuse. You know, th those are all very important things to keep in mind while somebody is in rehab. So now let's say <clears throat> I ended my rehab and I'm going back home. I decided I'm going back home. When I go back home, if there are steps in my house, if the bathroom's on the second floor, if I am not able to be in my home, that's a very important factor to determine before I leave the facility, right? And so it's very important to analyze how practical it would be for someone to return home. If I returned home and I needed help after those 45 days, I'd have to hire privately if I had assets. If I didn't have assets, I could apply for Medicaid. Same thing with the nursing home. If I were to stay in the nursing home past those 47 days, let's say when I got terminated off of Medicare, I have two options. I could pay privately or I can go on to Medicaid. Now, Medicaid is different from Medicare. And I always say, you look at the last few letters. Medicare cares for those over 65. Medicaid aids those who don't have assets. Now, not having assets doesn't mean that you've never had assets. Um, Medicaid planning can be done as long as there's sufficient time before applying for Medicaid to be able to get you eligible now. In order to qualify for Medicaid, they look at the medical picture and the financial picture. From the medical side, you need to have activities of daily living that you can't do by yourself, three of them. Bathing, toileting, showering, um, you know, uh, changing, dressing, getting out of bed, transferring. It is not for supervisory. They won't give you an aid just because you have dementia and you need someone to look after you. That cannot be <clears throat> the only reason why you're applying for Medicaid. So that's something to keep in mind. So from the medical side, you have to qualify medically. From the financial side, they look at two things. They look at your income and they look at your resources. From the income side, you have to make less than $794 a month to qualify. From the financial side, from the resource side, you have to have less than $15,900 to qualify. These numbers are as of this week, they just started. Because every year they increase it with the social security. If the social security uh, increases, they also increase the, the figures. So those are the two most recent figures. That doesn't mean that if you're above those limits, you won't qualify. That's why you have us, right? Um, an elder law attorney will help you move around assets if possible, right? And, and do whatever type of planning is needed to get you to qualify if possible at that time. So the financial picture has to also be intact in order for you to put in your application. If they see that you had $18,000 in assets, you're not going to qualify unless you need a spend down. So it's very important that before you put in an application, all of the numbers are met. And what do they look at when they look at those figures? All of your assets, excluding your primary residence, right? So your primary residence can be exempt if it's under about 893000 I believe, uh, if it's worth less than that. So you can apply if you own a home, as long as your cash assets are less than that 15900 
They look at your bank accounts, your CDs, your investment accounts. They look at all of the assets that you have in your name, excluding retirement accounts, IRAs, 401ks, rollover IRAs. Those IRAs are protected. IRA annuities are protected as well, meaning that the asset itself, let's say the IRA is composed of $100,000, Medicaid cannot touch that $100,000. However, you have to take out a distribution from there every year as per the IRS guidelines, right? So Medicaid also requires you to take out that distribution. So even if you're under the uh, required age of 72 to withdraw, if you're disabled and you need Medicaid assistance, they will still require you to take out a required minimum distribution. So it's very important that that's being met in order for that IRA to be exempt, that 100,000 to be untouched and not counted toward that 15,900, you have to be taking that distribution. And that distribution should really be taken monthly so that the numbers can work out. And I'll go into more detail on that. But essentially, again, those IRAs, those 401ks are protected. Um, it's very important that you don't shift assets around without speaking to an attorney, an elder law attorney who does this kind of work. I've had scenarios where clients have said, yeah, I'm going to come and speak to you. And then they don't come, but they do their own planning because they heard from people that they should move everything out of mom's name. And they've literally moved IRAs, cashed out IRAs and moved them out of their parents' name saying, then come to me and said, I did it. I moved everything out of the name. And now we've messed up, right? Because that IRA was protected. That IRA is now going to be taxed because if they took it out of a traditional IRA, they've caused an income tax. So please don't do any moving without getting counsel. Um, So those IRAs, IRA annuities, 401ks, 403bs, those are protected assets. As long as you're taking your distributions from them. Now they look at, like we said, checking savings accounts. They look at investment accounts. They look at cash value of life insurances. So that's important because a lot of people neglect to think or or don't realize that life insurances with cash values actually have a pot of money associated to them. So if you have a life insurance and it has $10,000 cash value, but the death benefit is but the death benefit, excuse me, is $100,000, Medicaid sees the $10,000 as a cash value, as as if it's a bank account. So that $10,000 will be counted towards your $15,900. So you would need to have only another $5,900 in another account, a checking account or a savings account. So it's very important that the big picture is looked at to ensure that you meet the guidelines and you're under the $15,900. So as long as your assets are under that amount, you can put in an application for Medicaid. Now, with your income, it's a little bit different. So for income purposes, we know we said the the $794 per month is what you're allowed to have. What that means is that if you have income that's greater than $794, it doesn't automatically disqualify you from Medicaid. You have two options at that time. Two seems to be the the lucky number within Medicaid. You have two options at that time. The first option is you pay your excess income to Medicaid as a spend down. So essentially, if I had $1,000 a month in income and I was allowed the $794, I'd have to give them $106 a month as a contribution toward my care. Now, $106 a month doesn't sound like it's a lot of money, and it it may not be to some people, but $104, you know, could be money that could be used toward rent, or it could be money used toward con Edison. So if you're paying it to Medicaid, you no longer have it to be able to use it for yourself. So what Medicaid has allowed, or what the state has allowed, is they allow people to pay that $106 instead to the second option, which is called a pooled income trust. The pooled income trust is with a not-for-profit organization that can automatically debit that $106 from your account, put it into their account, 
and hold it for you in that special account. Now they charge a monthly fee, there's a setup fee as well, but you can use the assets that you put into that account to be able to pay your expenses. And so it's important to know that the pooled income trust will enable you to continue to live at home because you can use the money from the pool trust to continue your everyday life. Now you can't pull out cash from it. You'd have to send your bills over to them to be able to get those bills paid. That's the option that most of my clients choose because they need their income to live. So it's very important that you look at your options and you ensure that you have the appropriate option in place so that if one day you do need the care, you've chosen what will work best for you. So that would be how we would take care of your extra income on a monthly basis. If you would give me just one second, I'm having a little bit of a technical issue. I'm sorry, give me one second. I will be right back. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Can everyone yes. hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Technic beauty of technology is that it's, it allows us to co connect, but sometimes it doesn't work at its best. Really a way to protect your income would be the pool trust. And that, that would be the method that I typically recommend that people take so that we could be able to ensure that you can continue to use your income on a monthly basis. Now, <clears throat> what people have to, to realize is that in order for you to engage in Medicaid planning, it's very important that the planning be done ahead of time. And typically the type of planning that has to be done ahead of time is so that you could be able to protect your assets. The reason for that is because when you apply for Medicaid, Medicaid has a look back period. And the look back period is essentially Medicaid being able to turn around and say, what have you done with your assets in the past five years or two and a half years? So I'll give you an example. If you're applying for Medicaid in a nursing home, Medicaid looks back five years to see what you've done with your money. When you put in your application, the applications are typically about this high, maybe, maybe, maybe higher depending on the client. But the Medicaid application itself will essentially ask you for bank statements and life insurance statements and annuity statements for the past five years. So you have to show them every single transaction done in that account. Every dollar spent over $2,000 in one transaction has to be accounted for. So if mom or dad were going to the bank every month and pulling out $2,500 because they used cash, right? That's a very typical thing that would, would happen with some of my older clients. They live on cash. So they would essentially go to the bank and pull out money every month. Every transaction that's $2,000 or greater, we would have to explain to Medicaid where that money went. So it's very important that those transactions are kept track of. If there is any transaction made over $2,000 that cannot be accounted for, Medicaid will create a penalty period for those assets. So essentially what would happen is that 
they would add up all of the assets that were transferred without an explanation, whether it be cash withdrawals, whether it be transfers to children, let's say gifts that were made for baptisms, birthdays, Christmases, whatever other holidays that you may have given gifts. If the transactions are 2000 or more, it triggers, it triggers a warning to them essentially. And if you cannot explain where those assets went, it will create a penalty period for that applicant. So let's say by the end of the five years, we've calculated that $100,000 has left mom or dad's account and we couldn't figure out where that money went. We couldn't get receipts um, or the money was gifted to someone who can't give it back to us. What will happen is that Medicaid will essentially at that point tell the applicant, look, you now have a penalty of $100,000. And until you pay the nursing home $100,000, we will not accept your application for care. So what would have to happen at that point to that client is that they would have to pay privately out of pocket for that $100,000 penalty. And a lot of times people don't have that kind of money. So it creates a bigger issue and it makes them ineligible for Medicaid. So it's very important that transfers are not made again without consulting with counsel because you can move money around and then we have no way of either tracing it or a way of being able to protect it for Medicaid purposes. Now I said that the, the nursing home look back is five years. Uh, up until last April, or I guess October, or even until now, there was no look back for home care. So I could apply, I could have moved mom or dad's assets today and applied for them to get Medicaid on February 1st, and they would have been eligible. But as of April of last year, there was a new law that was passed with the budget, which now makes a look back for home care two and a half years. And so the very complicated thing with this is that there is no written rule yet on how they're going to impose this Medicaid um, change. And it's such a big change. It came at a really tough time. Um, but essentially, the, you know, the state is, is starting to crack down and, and make rules and try to keep pe people from qualifying right away. So what has happened is that we were told back in April that come October 1st, anybody making transfers after October 1st would be subject to the new look back period of two and a half years for home care services. Home care services are when somebody comes to help you with your activities of daily living, like I mentioned before. When October came, we were told, oh, no, wait, we're not going to start implementing it now. It was actually back like in July or August. They said, we're not going to implement it in October. But for anybody applying after January, we're going to start implementing that two and a half year look back. Well, I think October, November passed and they said, you know what? We're not going to do January. We're not ready yet. Or maybe because of COVID, um, we're going to start in April. So at this time, all the applications that we've put in have not been subject to the two and a half year look back. Come April 1st, supposedly, they will be subject to this two and a half year look back for anybody having transferred their assets after October 1st. So a lot of this is a little bit up in the air, but what I can urge you and, and tell you and direct you is that if somebody that, that you are taking care of or that you are with needs assistance before now, really, um, I would urge you to put in the application right away. As long as the planning was done appropriately and you move the assets out, they will hopefully still get approved as long as everything was done properly. So... After April, though, they may be subject to that look back if they've transferred their assets after October. So it's very important to keep that April date deadline really um, at, the, at the front of your minds so that your, your loved one doesn't get excluded from this little sliver of time that they could still put in their application. So home care is a little bit easier to get because it's just subject to that two and a half year look back, whereas nursing home care has that five year look back. And, you know, Medicaid is, is very helpful in a lot of scenarios, um, especially where someone has to go into a nursing home. 
something to keep in mind for those who do go into a nursing home is that when they are in the nursing home, depending on whether or not they have a spouse living at home, that's going to de- going to dictate whether or not that individual will be able to keep any of their income. So if you have a spouse at home, that spouse will be able to take a certain amount of your income to bring them up to a certain threshold. If you don't have a spouse at home and you're by your, you just have children, but you go into a nursing home, Medicaid will take all of your income except for $50 because their thought is, well, we're taking care of you. We're feeding you where, you know, you're getting bathed here. Everything you need is here. We're only giving you an allowance of $50. The rest of your income, whether it's $1,000 over that or whether it's $4,000 and a good pension over that, will go to the nursing home as a contribution towards your care. So that's something to, to know. Um, For spouses that are in the community, there are special provisions that allow spouses to keep certain assets and that allow spouses to make transfers to themselves. That's where that power of attorney that I mentioned earlier is just key. If a loved one needs to go into a nursing home, a lot of times we use their power of attorney to shift assets over from the sick spouse to the healthy spouse. Those transfers are exempt we can make those transfers and not have to worry about a five-year look back. Other transfers are also exempt. A transfer of assets to a special needs trust for a disabled child, as long as it meets certain qualifications as well. There's of course other little rules that you have to match in your supplemental needs trust. As long as you do that, transfers to disabled children can be exempt. Transfer of a house to a caretaker child, a child who's lived with you for at least two years from the date that you put in your application, that can also be exempt. So it's very important to speak to an elder law attorney about the different options that could be available. One word of caution, the internet in this scenario can be very dangerous. Medicaid is state specific. Every state has its own rules and the rules are ever-changing. It's good to do research, it's good to get information, but it's not good to get your guidance off of the internet, just like you don't, shouldn't be getting diagnosed off of WebMD, right? Um, You have an ailment, you go to a doctor. You have a, a legal issue, you go to an attorney. Another word of caution is that there are non-legal groups offering legal advice to people at lower rates than attorneys do. I always say you get what you pay for. So you have to be very, very careful that when you hire anybody that they know the law and that they work within the law. Non-legal groups, people, uh, companies who don't have attorneys may not know the law and they, and they shouldn't be practicing the law because it is illegal for them to be doing that. We've had many scenarios where you know families have gone to some of these agencies, they've done the applications and they've missed something. Um, or they've caused the family to lose the family home after death. So it's very important that all of this gets looked at. And big picture, again, all the details have to be exposed. A Medicaid application is a, is, is a beast. I always call it, it's, it's one of the hardest things that we do around here. It's time consuming, it takes a lot of effort, and it is all encompassing. They look at every transaction, we have to explain everything. I always tell my clients, you're going to get tired of hearing from us within a three month within the three month time frame that we're going back and forth, exchanging information because you may send me something and I may need more information uh, on top of that. So it's a process that takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of effort, um, but it's important to get guided the right way before you start making moves and transferring assets and doing things like that. I know that I've been speaking a lot. I'm almost at about an hour at this time. Um, There is so much information that I could probably provide to you. I just don't want to make your head spin anymore. So I think I want to open up the floor or the laptop or the phone to uh, whoever it is who may have a question. Um, Jacqueline, I don't know how you want to moderate. Um, If you do have a question, if you could use the raise hand function and I can unmute you, or you can use the chat box.
I have a question. Sure. Um, what if you have a lot of um, trusts set up? Do they look at your trust? Yeah, so Medicaid looks at everything that you have. Um, for individuals who want to engage in planning, trusts are, are usually the best options to use in order to qualify down the line for Medicaid. So a trust has a lot of different ways that it, that it can be created. In order for the assets in a trust to be completely protected, they have to be irrevocable. And they have to not allow the, the, the person who created the trust to have access to the principle of that trust. So I actually came across a trust a few weeks ago, which was irrevocable, but allowed the grantor to have access to all of the principle. So the attorney who prepared so that obviously trust, made a mistake. Um, so, so the, the trust, trust can't be, you can't be the trust and the trustee. You, you can, in other words, like if you put your house in a trust, Mm -hmm. You can't have uh, control over that trust. Correct. You can't have control or access to be able to access principal. So the two types of major trusts are irrevocable and revocable. Irrevocable trusts, and I always say that an irrevocable trust is kind of like a box, right? Think of a box where you put your assets in it, you close the box, and you lock it up. You give the key away. With the irrevocable trust, You've given the key away to somebody else that you trust. You now have no control over the assets in the box. And so those assets are out of your name, out of your control. You can use and enjoy them. So our trust, our irrevocable trust, say that the grantor can live there for the rest of their life rent-free. They can collect the income if they want to make it an income-only trust. They can um, pay the expenses of the house the way that they always have been paying the expenses but they have the exclusive use and occupancy of that house. No one can kick them out. So the trust can allow you to do that, to reside in a property if the property is within the trust. However, you can't be able to access any funds that you've put into the trust. So if you've deposited $100,000 into the trust, you've basically washed your hands of it. It's no longer yours. You can collect income if it's an income only trust. So like if that 100,000 is generating $5,000, you know, a quarter in income, that'd be a great investment. But if it was generating $5,000 a quarter in um, investments, you can get the dividends and the interest. However, you cannot access that $100,000. So if you did have a trust and you were applying for Medicaid, the answer is yes, you would absolutely have to provide Medicaid with a copy of your trust. And if it's not irrevocable, you're probably not going to qualify because those assets in a revocable trust, which is the box where you keep the control, you can revoke it, you can undo it whenever you want because you have the key, right? In a revocable mm -hmm. trust. If you have that control, that means that you have the ability to use those assets for your care. So Medicaid is going to say, well, you have control over those assets. Use them. They're yours. You never really gave them up. Yeah. So it. it's, imp it's important to, to keep those two distinctions in mind. Now, with that said, some people don't feel comfortable preparing irrevocable trust or transferring their assets to irrevocable trusts, and that's perfectly fine. Um, but something to keep in mind is if you don't, those assets could then be susceptible to Medicaid collection, or you may have to use them before you qualify for Medicaid. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Any other questions? I do think we have. I have another question. So do, you, do you recommend setting up a trust, whether it's revocable or irreversible, if you have a substantial amount of assets? So it depends on what it is that you are trying to achieve. Are you doing tax planning? Or are you doing Medicaid planning? Or are you just trying to avoid probate? I'm not the kind of attorney that walks around telling everybody to create trusts. I think for some yeah. scenarios, a trust would be a waste of money. Um, there are some attorneys who do that, um, who say everybody needs a trust. Avoid probate by all means. You know, I'm not afraid of probate. We're a trust and estates firm. We do probate all day, breakfast, lunch, dinner, midnight snacks. So I, you know, I'm not afraid of probate depending on the circumstances. If a single woman came to me who had no spouse, no children, she had, her parents were deceased. 
she had no siblings, her next of kin were cousins she hasn't seen in, in you know, 30 years, then yes, a revocable trust would be appropriate. So I think that every case brings its appropriate response. Um, if you're trying to avoid probate for purposes, you're trying to kick someone out of a will, let's say, or you're trying to avoid it because you don't want to leave it to your next of kin or do something different, then avoiding probate is definitely a good idea and you should do some sort of trust to avoid it. If you're trying to engage in Medicaid planning, the irrevocable trust is the only way you can do that. And the good thing about the irrevocable trust is that you don't have to put all your assets in it. So I often have a lot of clients who will come to me and say, look, we want to put the house in, but we have $100,000 in cash. We don't want to put our cash in. And I say, that's perfectly fine. You know, mm -hmm. you can pick and choose what you're willing to put away. Um, starting the clock, you know, for certain assets would be wise, especially if it was your home, especially if it was your biggest asset. You know, if you have a million dollars in cash, maybe you, or investments or whatever it is, you may want to put half of it away. You know, it all depends mm -hmm. on your circumstances and what it is that you're trying to achieve. But I, I don't want to say that trusts are for everybody. It's really just fact specific, depending on what it is that you're, you're wanting to do. So then it's more like for a tax planning. If, if you have a sizable, um, if you have a sizable estate, trusts are so helpful for estate tax purposes, um, whether it be gifting, right, moving assets out of your name, getting them out of your estate, uh, depending on the size of your estate. Sometimes you want to keep assets in your estate because they get what's called a step up in basis, right? So as an example, right. if I bought my house, I live in Astoria where most of my clients who bought their houses paid like three pennies for them back in the 40s and 50s. I see my Astoria crew nodding their head. Um, so for those people who've, who've paid a couple of bucks for their, their houses that are now worth millions, we don't want to gift that asset away and put it into a trust and give it away totally. The trust that we would create would need to keep it in our estate for tax purposes. So each asset is going to be or not. You want to gift an asset away depending on what would happen to it after your death. Does it increase in basis, right? The house is in a story we don't want to give away during life. So I would never tell a client to gift an asset to their kids that has appreciated in value so much because when their kid takes that asset, they're going to keep their parents' tax basis of the three pennies that they paid for it in the 40s and 50s. So mm -hmm. they will lose the opportunity to increase the basis when their parents pass away. It gets, it gets a little bit involved, but yes, trust can definitely be used for tax planning. I also tend to use trusts when I'm giving wealth to the next generation. Um, when I want, when a parent wants, let's say, you know, to ensure that their child's spouse doesn't get access to an asset. That's another good way to use a trust, another reason to use the trust. So using trusts when you're giving away wealth is definitely a good option, but not for everybody. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Genevieve, I see you have your hand raised. And I have a little... Uh, and little, the little hand little, raised. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, Okay, you know, we, I was working with for my mother on for Medicaid. Here's my question. If she doesn't need Medicaid, like she doesn't need it, she's 95, but she doesn't need any help today, but she qualifies and I've got all the paperwork together. Do I wait until she needs the help? I mean, or you, you understand, do I put the papers forward because uh, financially she's eligible, but she doesn't really qualify for that kind of help? right now? It depends on the type of Medicaid you're trying to obtain. If you're just trying to get the assistance for that 20% that Medicare doesn't cover, then yes, you should put in the application. She's, well, she's got, she pay, she has a supplement, so I don't have a problem. Right. So then you wouldn't have to worry about that. For long-term care, the problem with long-term care is you, you're not eligible until you're medically needy. Okay. So I and don't so, this. Yeah. If you can't put, if you don't need help with your activities of daily living, you're not going to pass go. Okay. Because there, there is an evaluation that will determine whether or not you need the assistance. Got it. Um, and, and that evaluation will say, no, wait, you could do things on your own, then you're not eligible for the care. Right. Right. So, so it's important to keep that in mind before putting in that type of application for long-term care. Uh, or home care, right? Or home care. Yeah, that's long-term care. Home care okay. is long-term care. Um, so how long, 
what, how long does it take? Is it like a three month process once you put the paperwork in? Is uh, it month? Is it a year? How long does it take? So probate, just to give you some examples of how our state works, probate used to take us a month. Now it's taking us eight to 10 weeks at a minimum, right? Medicaid applications, we used to get back within 45 to 60 days. There are some applications. There was one that I was dumbfounded. We submitted it like last week and we got it the beginning of this week. It was like a week turnaround, which I had never seen before. So I think it depends on when you get the government to look at it um, and, and depending on how complicated your situation is. So I know that my cases that have trusts involved in them or that have um, assets that were transferred do take a little bit longer. They sometimes go through the legal department. I would say for those types of scenario where they're a little more complicated, I'd say two to three months right now um, where it's a simpler process. It could be a week. I just learned the week <laughs> um, and it could be a month. Right. You know, it depends on the, on the worker who's working on the case and how backed up they are, how backlog they are. So we don't, Medi put, we don't, we don't put this in. We can get all our information together, but we don't yes. do it until we actually need it and for long-term care yes for long-term care and if she uh and if she gives under two thousand dollars as a gift she doesn't have to like if she gives her grandchild the gift of a hundred a thousand dollars we don't have to justify that for right now the, the law says two thousand or greater okay all right good thank yeah, you i can't promise you what it'll be in a month from now yeah who, who knows? Okay. And that's the thing I want everyone to be conscious of with Medicaid is that it's ever changing, right? We would have never imagined us having a two and a half year look back. We knew at some point that we're going to start a look back, but, you know, we didn't think it'd be during COVID for, for sure. Um, you know, it, Medicaid will change and constantly change. They're going to make it harder for people to qualify for Medicaid. And the reasoning for that is because the budget can't allow for it. You know, people are, you know, just... If the, the state is, is losing a lot of money on the Medicaid system. So they're going to make it harder for people to qualify. They're also going to make it harder for you to get the right amount of hours that you may need. So a big part of Medicaid is, you know, when you say that you need the help, they evaluate how many hours they're going to give you. And so you may need 24 hours, but they may only give you eight a day, you know, so that's something to keep in mind when you're going for Medicaid. You may not get exactly what you ask for. And that, it, and that is actually becoming harder. It's becoming much harder to be able to get what it is that you ask for. And one more question. If, if the house is, she has the living estate, as you know, could that be transferred to the kids? I get it now. Can it be transferred to the kids or it's upon death? So... There are attorneys who are, who are torn on this. I have a very firm stance on life estates. I don't tend to use life estates for many different reasons. Um, trusts are definitely the safer alternative to a life estate. It is very rare. And I'd say in my 10 years of practice of just doing this type of work, I've probably done five or six life estates. Life estates don't always make sense because a life estate is essentially, instead of putting a house into a trust where you're removing it out of your name, you are keep, you're giving the house away, but you're giving away a future interest mm -hmm. and you're keeping the right to live there for your life. Mm -hmm. And so when mom creates a life estate, she holds on to the current house, right? Like currently, as long as she's alive, it's hers. She can collect the rent. She pays the expenses. She lives there. That's what a life estate does. Mm -hmm. But the deed itself says that the house is yours, subject to her living there. Mm -hmm. And so if something happened to you, if you declared bankruptcy, if you died, where does that house go? Right? So there's always that problem where the person who's received the house can lose it mm. and create a problem for mom. Whereas if it's in a trust... It's locked up there until mom passes away, mom, dad, whoever pass away, right. and no one can touch it. Even if you died, the trust says, if my daughter died before me, the house goes to her kids when I die. When I die. Right? So the life estate is not the foolproof method. Mm -hmm. Now, living in Queens, you have added benefits of being able to rent a house. But for someone who has a house in Nassau, if mom had a life estate on a house and then had to go into a nursing home, 
And that house now can't be kept up by the kids because the taxes are astronomical. The upkeep is expensive. And like I said before, mom's income has to be paid to the nursing home. They're not going to let you use her money to pay for a house that she's not returning to. In that kind of a scenario, the house would have to get sold. And when the house gets sold, that life estate is worth something. It has a value. So if mom's in the nursing home, that value will have to be paid toward her care. Even if she has so a life estate? A life estate is worth something. It has a value. But so you can never sell a house, right? Okay. You should never sell a house with a life estate on it when mom goes into a nursing home. Oh, but okay. if it was in a trust, I got it. if it was in a trust, it's a different scenario. The house, the entire house would be sold. All the proceeds would go back into the trust right. and no one cannot, you know, they're not accessible to Medicaid or to mom's care. But as long as so, she, but once she dies, if you're still there, I mean, different they don't story. The house. Correct. Okay. They Just can the access the house <laughs> as long as your life estate was done more than the five years for nursing home and two okay. and a half years for home care, then it's okay. But again, a life estate has its shortfalls, not in your scenario, but in other scenarios, which is why everyone is so different. Thank you. Thank you. I think there was someone else with a question. We have some in the chat box. Um, yes, in the chat box. Okay, so what happened from Kim Schwartz, what happens if someone has private medical insurance in addition to Medicare as opposed to just the supplement? Does that change the eligibility? So Medicaid always wants you to, wants to be the payer of last resort. So I have a scenario now where the, the wife is still working and the husband is insured under the wife's insurance and that's great. He can stay insured under the wife's insurance and, and Medicaid will allow them to keep the money to continue to pay that premium. So if the premium is $200 a month, Medicaid would allow them to keep the $794 that they're allowed to have plus the $200 a month to pay that premium. Because again, Medicaid wants to be the payer of last resort. So the payer, the first payer is going to be the insurance of the wife and then Medicare will be the back Medicaid, excuse me, or Medicare or both, depending on how it's set up, would be the backups. But Medicaid wants to be last. So they 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 emphasize the, the need for you to keep your private insurance and to supplement it with Medicaid. Did that answer your question, Kim? Not sure if Kim is still here. Okay. So then we have one other question. Um, of from Loida, can a special needs trust be used to help with Medicaid and spend down? Example is a disabled adult receives 1300, they have a spend down of 437. How can the special needs trust help so as to not to give Medicaid the 437? So the 437 is that excess income that I was referring to earlier. So if instead of receiving, um, <clears throat> they, would, they would continue to get their 1300, and they would put that 437 in that supplemental needs trust, um, excuse me, the pooled income trust, which is run with the not-for-profit organization. And the pooled income trust is a supplemental needs trust. So that money, depending on the age of the individual, if they're over 65, that money would go into the pooled income trust. If they're under 65, they can create their own supplemental needs trust where they can put that 437. So the answer is yes, you can use the supplemental needs trust. Depending on the age, you'd either put it into the pooled income trust, which is a form of supplemental needs trust. If they're under 65, they could put it in their own first party trust instead. Loida, did that answer your question? Hi. Hi, Loida. Happy New Year to you. How you know, are you? Thank you. Good, thanks. I'm a little confused because with George, you know that he's autistic. 20 years. And he's 20 years old, and he has been having a spend down of $437, which I really believe is a bit high and don't want to take. You know that we have the supplemental special needs uh, trust for George being disabled. So would I then have to place those $437 into that special needs trust or do so, I have to create a pool trust? 
so we're going to talk separately about this because it's going to get very detailed. But just as a okay. general idea for individuals who have special needs, there are different type of supplemental needs trust that can be created for them. If the special, if the individual who has special needs creates a trust, that's a first party supplemental needs trust. They can put their own money into that first party supplemental needs trust. They cannot put their money into a trust that their parent created for them because the trust the parent created for them is a third party supplemental needs trust. So there are two very different types of trusts. So it's very important that, that you comply with the rules of each respective trust. Um, but you and I will speak on the side for that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's, it gets very, um, it gets very involved, especially when someone is receiving government benefits as to what income they can receive, what income they cannot receive, you know, and it's, it's important to keep up with it. I have a client now who didn't realize that the, she's got so much on her plate. She didn't realize that the account exceeded the $2,000 threshold, which she's allowed to have, her son's allowed to have. And so he's going to lose his benefits. And they rely so much on those benefits because that child has a lot of um, medical care that he needs. So it's very important that the numbers are complied with. If Social Security says you can't go over 2,000, and that means you have to stay under 2,000. Um, but special needs planning is, is so key and so critical, able, especially, able yep, you can establish ABLE accounts. You could do a lot of different things. So it's very important for a family to seek out advice in those types of scenarios. Can you Anybody explain a have... little bit about that ABLE account and how does it work? So an ABLE account is actually fairly new. The government now allows um, the supplemental needs beneficiary to have access to their own account up to a certain amount of money. And so they can use the ABLE account to, to basically increase their ability to have more than the 2000 that SSI allows them to have when they're getting benefits. And now this case may be different for you guys um, because it depends on if your parents are disabled and receiving disability, you can get it if you're under the age of 22. So there are certain different circumstances and every situation is very different. But essentially an ABLE account allows the disabled beneficiary, instead of putting their money into a supplemental needs trust where they can't personally access it, the ABLE account allows them to have access to it and to use it um, for themselves. So it's a very helpful and also fairly new. I think we've had it for a couple of years. It just recently came out by the federal government, I think two, two or three years that the ABLE account is able to be used. Thank you. No problem. Does anybody have other questions? Hey, Constantina, this is Larry. I have a question. Hey, Larry, how are you? I'm doing well, hope you're well. So I, I suspect I know the answer, but in a situation, you know, you have uh, ir irrevocable trust, right? And the grantor is entitled to, to, the, uh, to the income, right? So in income only, dividend income only trust, right? Mm -hmm. Income from that trust, is that counted um, as income? Yes, that's part of the income that you're allowed to have for Medicaid purposes. All income is included. Social security, pension, income from dividends and interest, rental income, income generated out of a trust, any income that you uh, receive that you're even entitled to receive will be counted on that, on your income line for Medicaid purposes. So any, so any excess income now has to go, like you said, these two options into this pooled income trust, or you have to pay it directly to Medicaid. Mm -hmm. Correct. And did I hear Correct. you correctly that if it goes into a pool, pooled income trust, you have to send the bills, you know, the, the you know, you have to send the bills to the, that pool and they, they would pay it? Yes. You send the income and the bills and they, they pay the bills. Correct. So how I usually do is I set up on auto pay, on like an ACH debit, so it automatically withdraws from the person's account on, let's say, the 15th of the month, puts it into the pool trust. And then what you could do to simplify things is you can charge everything to the credit card and just send the credit card bill every month mm -hmm. to the trust. Now, as long as there's sufficient excess income in that pool trust, then the credit card will pay it. But if there's not enough, then obviously that's where you're going to have to pay out of the, the person's checking account, your mom's checking account. Mm -hmm. 
So if let's say the, the excess income going to the pool trust is $1,000 a month, but the credit card bill is $1,500 a month, right? You'll have mm -hmm. to use the thousand that went to the pool trust and then the other 500 from the checking account. Okay, and just when, when the utility of the pool income just in other words, you run the five year period, the look back period, right? Mm -hmm. um, can you terminate can you, well, let me, can you terminate this arrangement with the pool income trust at any time? Yes, you can tell them you no longer want to be part of it. The only reason you should terminate it, though, is because either the person passed away or they went into a nursing home. As long as they're receiving the benefits, they need to have that because Medicaid goes back and they ask you for the, VO, the, the verification of deposit. They want to make sure that during the months that you were receiving that care, you were actually depositing your money there. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. No problem there. Anybody have any other questions? I don't think I see anything in the chat box. Okay, well, thank you so much for joining us. I hope you found this to be informative. There's a lot of information. Yeah. How do we get in touch with you? What's the best way if we want you to you know, we want to sure. So the best way to get in touch with me is typically you can either call me or email. Um, if you call and I'm not available, you can set up a time to meet with me or to speak with me with my paralegal um, who answers all my calls and keeps control of my calendar and life. Mm -hmm. um, so she'll be able to tell you what days and times work best. Sometimes if you prefer to email me, we could set up a time to speak that way. Um, I'm not always in the office. Sometimes I'm in meetings and whatnot. So uh, email also works. My email is my letter of my first name. So C with my last name, Papa Giorgio at vmmlegal.com. Thank you. Talk to you. And then my number is 516-437-4385 extension 141. Okay. Thank you. And Roy just sent it out in the chat box in case anybody wants to see it. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much, Constantina. That was really helpful, and I hope everyone got some useful information out of that. Um, join us in March, I believe, March 4th for our next um, event. So I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Happy New Year. Have a Happy good day. Bye.